Hello, this is Dr. Saldivar. Today's video lecture is looking at chapter one of the Feldman text, Essentials of Understanding Psychology. So Feldman begins by providing us with a simple, straightforward definition of psychology. We can think of psychology as the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. For our course and most psychology courses, these behaviors and mental processes will focus on humans, but just so you know, it is possible for psychology, for some psychologists to look at non-human or uh, animal behaviors and processes as well. Now the key here is the scientific study. Psychologists use the scientific method to describe, predict, and explain human behavior and the stuff, the processes that happen inside of our minds. The scientific method is what separates psychology from other fields that look at how humans behave. Fields like uh, history, philosophy, those are important fields, but they're not grounded in the scientific method the way psychology is. There are various subfields of psychology. We'll look at those during the semester in this course and we'll consider some of the topics, some of the ideas that are central to those subfields. Examples of subfields within psychology include looking at how humans grow and change over their lifetimes. That is developmental psychology. And there's also the study of how society affects the behaviors, the thinking of individuals, and that would be social psychology. But for this chapter, we're just introducing psychology as a science in a general kind of way. We'll look at these other subfields later in the semester in the course. Now, psychology is rooted in research, meaning the stuff, the ideas, the concepts that are discussed are not just psychologists' opinions. They're not just common sense. They are grounded in a discovery process, in a process of research that uses a scientific method. Hopefully you'll recall this from, if not other science classes in college, then per perhaps hopefully you um, had an opportunity in high school to learn the scientific method. It's shown here on the screen. It's the process that begins with observing the world around us, designing or developing some kind of question about something in the world, forming a hypothesis, which is a testable question we want to answer about the world around us. We conduct some kind of scientific study. Uh, an experiment is one example, although there are other ways of conducting research that are not uh, necessarily using the experimental approach. And then we arrive at some conclusion based on the research we've done, and that lets us walk away with some results. And the results can help us consider whether our original hypothesis was correct or incorrect, and further help us develop more hypotheses going forward. This is the basic process of the scientific method. It's systematic. It's the way that all sciences, including psychology, acquire knowledge in, about whatever stuff they're interested in. The kind of research that a chemist or a physicist or a biologist does can look very different from the kind of research done by a psychologist. Nonetheless, these are still examples of the scientific method. The goal of scientific method is to help us eventually, over time, after a lot of research is done and a lot of findings are made, to help us develop theories, which will provide broad explanations and allow us to make predictions about, in the case of psychology, about human behavior. Uh, hypotheses are the stepping stones that take us to these theories, because every cycle, every go-round of the scientific method is based on one or more hypotheses. Uh, just FYI, hypothesis is singular, hypotheses is plural. But the goal of a very particular cycle of the scientific method is to test one or more hypotheses, learn something, walk away with some findings, some results. That helps us refine uh, our hypotheses for next time. And over time, as our hypotheses get more and more refined and more accurate, that helps us offer theories, which give us a general guidance and understanding about how the world works around us. So again, a lot of details here, but the takeaway is that psychology is not common sense. It's not just people's opinion. It is grounded in a process of discovering stuff about the world around us. Now, an issue that 
uh, is taken up by Feldman in his first chapter, also looks at uh, where psychologists work. Those of you that are in this course because you're interested, perhaps, uh, or maybe have already decided to major or minor in psychology, or if you just have a general interest in psychology, that's why you're taking the course. You don't necessarily think you'll make a career of it. Uh, there's often a misunderstanding that comes from the world around us, from media, movies, TV shows, maybe even things you've heard from family or friends. Um, although certainly there are a lot of psychologists who work in what I'm going to call therapeutic settings. So these are psychologists who are clinical psychologists, uh, or they may have a individuals with a background in psychology that work as therapists or counselors. So they uh, provide mental health uh, support, behavioral health support for people that are troubled or have some some issues or challenges in their lives. Um, that is uh, only part of what psychologists do. As you can see from this pie chart, and this is based on a survey that was conducted in the 2010s, um, although I'm confident that more recent data, if we were to ask this question again of psychologists in, in, in the current year, the, the mix would be very similar. Now you'll see by looking at the pie chart that a plurality, meaning the biggest piece of the pie, uh, not, not a majority because it's not over 50%, but a plurality of psychologists work in uh, an academic setting in a university, college, or some other um, research enterprise. That's a 34% that are labeled uh, academic. Now, these individuals, these psychologists can come from all different backgrounds, but the point is that, that even if they're trained as a therapist or counselor, their day-to-day -day work is going to be teaching students uh, conducting and conducting research, um, maybe other scholarly things like writing textbooks and research articles. Um, about 24% of psychologists work in a clinical setting. So these are the kinds of folks that we tend to think of um, from a lot of movies and TV shows, individuals with white lab coats and, and clipboards that talk to patients or clients in a hospital, clinic, doctor's offices. 22% uh, of psychologists are in private practice. Most of these folks will have a clinical or therapeutic background, so they're also working with patients or clients. But some of them, uh, even if they work independently, uh, are not necessarily doing therapy. They may have other applications of psychology. They may work as consultants, for example, for businesses. There are psychologists who specialize in market research, helping companies figure out how to sell stuff more efficiently. Other psychologists might work in um, with companies in, in terms of helping develop uh, safe procedures for using their products. Uh, it depends on the individual psychologist and their background. Uh, you see 12% of psychologists work in an industrial setting. Again, a lot of big companies, especially any, any company where you're designing stuff to be used by humans, they often will have psychologists on board who specialize in cognition, which is my background. I'm a cognitive psychologist. That means I study stuff related to how uh, our, our minds work, how our thought processes work. But a pilot, as they're flying, while they're sitting in that cockpit, they need certain information. So um, big companies that make airplanes, jets, they will often hire, among others, a psychologist who specialize in understanding the, the layout of a cockpit so that the company is making sure that they're putting dials and readouts and monitors and, and uh, uh, computer screens and other, other aspects of the cockpit in places around this cockpit that make sense for the pilot. So that's an example of industrial psychology. And then there are other psychologists that work in schools and in other miscellaneous settings. Uh, again, the takeaway here, uh, if you are interested in psychology as a field, is here's kind of a, a preview of... Um, different opportunities you may have in terms of, of career. But also, if you are not looking at a career in psychology, if you're taking this course because you you, you need to uh, take a psychology course for your degree plan, uh, I invite you to consider that uh, even if you're, you're, you don't want to work in psychology yourself, be aware, be knowledgeable about what psychology is as a field and the fact that there are a lot of psychologists who are not simply working in therapy and counseling. As important as that work is, there's a lot more uh, to psychology than just the therapeutic aspects. Now, how does psychology study human behavior? As you probably can guess from what we've already discussed so far, there is a lot of specialization in psychology. The field is so large, it's impossible for, for one person to have a, a grasp of all of it, certainly. Um, so the, the field is cut up or divided up into different areas. Uh, neuroscience researchers specialize in the study of behavior, uh, mental processes from the perspective of the brain and nervous system. 
So if you think about it, and this will come up in, in the next chapter, uh, chapter two of the Feldman text, the foundation of all behavior is what's happening inside of our brains. Um, and so that uh, cellular level of stuff is what neuroscience looks at. And so that's how they, uh, those specialists approach studying human behavior. There's a psychodynamic research, and that focuses on the unconscious motivations that drive us. These kinds of um, researchers are looking more at um, understanding how and why people think about the world around them, especially if, uh, if that thinking is related to uh, our own lives. This has uh, a lot of therapeutic applications. Uh, behavioral researchers are um, using different kinds of research uh, designs, especially experimental designs, to measure observable behavior. This is typically what people think of uh, from movies and TV shows. If you see psychology represented other than clinical or, or, or therapeutic applications, um, this behavioral research is typically what you think of. A psychologist in a white lab coat with, uh, with a pencil behind their ear and they're putting rats through a maze or they're having humans solve a puzzle or whatnot and then timing how long it takes them to do that. That's an example of behavioral research. Cognitive researchers, like myself, we explore how people think about and how they come to understand and, and learn about themselves and the world around them. Um, since we uh, have difficulty seeing what our brains are doing in real time, uh, we often have to study cognition indirectly. We have to ask a lot of questions. We have to sort of get people to help, help us understand by communicating with us what it is they're thinking, how they are learning, how they're um, contemplating their own thinking and cognition. And then finally, a uh, final example here, humanistic researchers study the way that individuals grow and develop their own individual potential. So they're looking at issues related to um, emotion, personality, um, how people uh, see themselves in terms of their goals, their aspirations. So there are a lot of um, some clinical applications here, but also things like health psychology, um, sports psychology uh, has a humanistic aspect, right? If you're an, an athlete uh, and you want to improve your golf game or improve uh, how you swim, obviously there's an athletic, physical component, but there also there's also a mental component to being a good athlete, right? Especially in a competitive, uh, a competitive situation. So um, sports psychologists uh, are going to use a humanistic approach to try and uh, understand their part of the field and help. Uh, address the challenges, the issues of people that they work with. Now, these are, we've talked about the areas, um, the kinds of research people do in psychology, the exact methods of studying those different areas can vary a little bit from subfield to subfield, but generally, um, psychology research uh, includes archival research, that means existing data is, is taken uh, existing information that was gathered for some, perhaps some other purpose, but then is used by psychologists to help us understand stuff about human beings. Um, survey research, we ask people directly about their behavior, their beliefs, their opinions. Naturalistic observation is looking to see what people are doing in a naturalistic setting. So this is basically just going out into the field and observing what people are doing is an important tool in psychologist toolkit, and it's a common way that we gather data. Uh, correlation research. This is more quantitative or mathematical. We're looking at, uh, people who use this approach are looking at mathematical relationships between variables. Um, so this goes to um, often relationships that are, that are very difficult to, to just observe. And because they may not be directly observable, we have to rely on different statistical techniques. And then finally, experimental research. So here you're directly investigating the cause and effect relationship between different variables. And experimental research is uh, often seen as the gold standard of, of psychological research, but it's also the most difficult to carry out. And sometimes you may have a particular research question as a psychologist that is actually not best answered by an experiment. So uh, experimental research is something that a lot of, again, civilians, non-psychologists, non-scientists have heard about or, or been exposed to. But uh, although it is an important tool and it does help us in certain ways, it actually doesn't give us some answers in, in other ways. So all these different approaches to research and psychology 
uh, have their place. It just depends on what exactly you're trying to discover with your own research. It's important, speaking of research, that researchers, whether psychologists or other kinds of scientists, are expected to act ethically and respectfully towards research participants. Um, this means having guidelines, having rules and regulations that we follow to make sure that we're not hurting anyone uh, by the research we're doing, that we're not causing any kind of distress. In particular, there are some researchers that do use animals in their research. And again, you think of, of, of you know, you may have seen the movies, TV shows, psychologists putting rats through a maze, or those may seem like sort of just benign examples, but there are times where uh, animals may be put in more danger or, or, or may actually need to be euthanized uh, as part of a research process. So it's important for psychologists to have, again, rules, regulations, procedures to make sure that uh, animals are treated uh, humanely. Finally, uh, psychologists and all researchers are human, and uh, we're humans studying other humans, but that doesn't make us not human. The point of that being, like all humans, we have biases, we have prejudices, some of which we're, we're unconscious of, but some of which we are aware of. Good, strong research minimizes the impact of biases that researchers have, so that you have some confidence that the information you're gathering, the data you're collecting, is truly free of bias and thus can be trusted, can be used, can be analyzed to help us answer whatever questions we're trying to answer. To review the major ideas that we've covered here, psychology is a science of how we think, act, behave. It's grounded in applying the scientific method to explore different aspects of human behavior. It is not just common sense or gut feelings. That concludes this uh, presentation on chapter one of the Feldman text. I hope you found it helpful. Again, recall that this is not intended to uh, be, and is, is, is in fact not uh, an encyclopedic uh, recitation of all the information in chapter one. I simply plucked out the major ideas and major themes to help you go into the reading of chapter one with these major ideas uh, in the back of your mind, and hopefully that'll help make the reading process more efficient and more effective. Good luck.